So today we will be going over section 3.9, which is called differentials, and it's basically, in my opinion, the most important section of the whole, the whole shebang. Uh, now, what was it that we went over last time? Optimization. All right. Okay. So then, is there any optimization question you'd like to see solved? Before we get to differentials. Maybe you were just got curious and excited about optimization and sought out an optimization problem since Monday and you want to see what I have to say about it? Anybody? It's always entertaining to ask that question. <laughs> no, but sometimes, almost never, but sometimes students respond and say, yes, there was one. <laughs> but not today. Okay, <clears throat> so then, for now then, we're going to be in section 3.9, which is called differentials. Okay, so then the subject of today is a geometric picture, or at least t in my brain, it's a geometric picture. And so I want to give you the picture of what's happening. Okay, so let's say that I have a function. Okay, so then I'll uh, give the function in blue. But I need to change to the pin. Okay, so there's some nice looking function. And this will be, we'll give its name y is f of x. So that this is the x axis and this is the y axis. Okay, now uh, at this point, say right here, I can attach the tangent line. And I will do that. <coughs> So at least according to my eye, maybe something like that, going that way, and something like this, going the other way. So the tangent line looks like that. Okay, so I'm going to extend the tangent line just a little bit further. Okay, so now let's say that we're at the point of tangent attachment, the big fat red point. Okay, so that's where we are. Now two graphs are going through that point, the red graph and the blue graph. So if you were a traveler, you know, that would be a fork in the road and you could say, all right, I can either follow the blue graph or the tangent graph. Okay, you can follow either one. Okay, now, <coughs> the part of the important geometric thing about tangency is that if you look at the place of tangent attachment, the tangent attachment and the graph itself are arbitrarily close to each other. Right? They're as close as you wish. Right, they're so close that if you zoom in far enough, you can make it to where you, you, don't ha you don't have the ability to physically measure the difference anymore, right? You know, you don't have a scale small enough on your ruler to measure the difference. Okay, that's the point of tangent attachment. So then you can follow the red tangent or you can follow the blue curve. So let's say that we are here, and this is the position x. And we move over to the right to a new position, Okay, x plus delta x. Okay, so that how far did we move to the right? Delta x, right? Good. So then, so then, this horizontal distance here, right, the distance between those two things, is delta x. Okay, so then now I'm going to indicate some more points. Okay, so I guess I'll, what should I use? I guess I'll use pink. Pink's good. So then here, here's a point, and here's a point, and here's a point. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to extend this out just a little bit, and extend <coughs> this one out just a little bit. Extend this out just a little bit. And extend this one out just a little bit. Okay. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the differences between these horizontal extensions that I just made. Okay, so then now, as, as the graph moved, you know, as, as you moved along the graph, if you moved along the blue graph, then this is the distance, the vertical distance that you changed, right? The horizontal distance is delta, is delta x, and this was the corresponding vertical distance. So if the, correspond, if the horizontal distance we named delta x, then the vertical distance we're going to name what? Delta y. Okay, good. Delta y. All right. So then, in my picture, in my picture, what would you say? What is the correct response? That the that the graph went up faster or the tangent line went up faster? The graph went up faster. The graph is higher than the tangent line. Okay? So then so then, you know, they're not exactly the same. So then the distance, this other vertical distance has a different name. Has a different name. And we're going to call that vertical distance dy. Okay, and now what something is coincident here, and that is that, okay, well, the, the, the deltas, they, they refer to the function, how the function changed, right? I, I took the function change, and I'm calling it delta, and the, and the tangent change, I'm, calling, I'm using d's. So this horizontal distance has two different names. It is called dx, and it is also called delta x. So, you know, delta y over delta x, that's the slope of the secant line. That's the slope of the secant line. And dy over dx, that's the slope of the tangent line. That's the slope of the tangent line. So then now, what I want you to see is the following. Now, unfortunately, I can do lots of neat things with this, uh, with this electronic, but I can't make animations. So that now, what I want you to imagine is that those three pink points that I'm intersecting with the box move with the edge of the box. So I'm going to move the edge of the box side to side and imagine that the pink points are moving correspondingly. What I want you to see is what happens to those points as I move delta x toward, is, as I shrink delta x, right? as I make the, the secant line converge to the tangent line. What happens to the difference between the graph and the tangent line. It goes to zero, right? Out here it's not so good, right? You know, that's not maybe that's not very good for the problem. But notice as I move right now at that point the drawing of the tangent line and the function, the, the pins are so fat that you can no longer see the difference. Okay? So does everybody see what's happening here? Okay, so then I've kind of drawn this picture before a little bit in this class. So then now, what's, uh, if since I named this function dy dx, or since, sorry, since I named this function f of x, you know, we can say, well, y is f of x, and we can also say that, well, if I compute the derivative of the right-hand side, well, typically we call that f prime of x. And what notation is it that we use for the left-hand side of this equation, typically? dy dx, right? We're using dy dx because, after all, you know, we're naming the sides of this triangle. We're giving the vertical name dy and the horizontal name dx. And what is the slope of a triangle? Well, it's rise over run. It's dy over dx. OK, so then now the final thing is that <coughs> How much is dy? You know, so for example, if I was to say, you know, I'm interested in this particular dx, then what is dy going to be? Right? How do you figure out what the change is? And it literally is <laughs> algebraically just like this, f prime of x dx. OK, so then now, a slight word of warning, and that is that this picture is the picture that is presented in the book. Okay, and nothing that I've written, strictly speaking, is wrong. But you need to be very careful because these quantities dy and dx are not numbers. 
contrary to what the book says. I'm sorry, the author is just flat out wrong in this case. Okay, they're not numbers. I've treated them somewhat like numbers, or at least it appears that I've treated them like numbers in these two lines. Okay, because sort of how did I obtain the, the last line from the penultimate line? By multiplying both sides by dx. Okay, well, <coughs> fine. That's what it looks like, but these things are not actually numbers. <laughs> okay, so then now, what is the subject of today? The subject of today is this equation that I'm circling in red. Okay, so what it is, is that we can analytically compute dy. We can compute what dy is, and what dy is representing here, it's, ch it's representing how much the tangent attachment changes as you vary the, the x coordinate. So it's like saying, okay, we've been following the blue graph for a while, but I'm tired of doing that. It's too complicated to follow the blue graph. So I'm going to stop for just a minute, make a tangent attachment, and stop following the blue graph, and I'm going to start following the tangent attachment because that's easier because it's a straight line. Okay. So then what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, now I want to estimate how much y changes. But instead of, instead of estimating, instead of computing it directly, I'm going to use the tangent line to, to approximate it. And the reason why this is going to work is because, look, it's because of this picture. You know, maybe for your problem, the problem of the engineering or financial or whatever problem you're solving, you know, maybe that's not a good approximation. Okay, and what that, what that is telling you is that you need to make your tangent attachment closer to the point you're trying to approximate. But maybe, you know, maybe that's good enough. Right? So maybe that's you're trying to have some financial considerations and this is within one dollar and you're talking about millions of dollars. That's probably good enough. Okay? That's probably good enough. So does everybody get the general idea? We're going to be approximating things using tangent lines instead of actual functions. Okay, so any questions? <coughs> okay, good. So then let's do just sort of a canned example. So for example, for example, we'll take uh, y is x squared. And what the point, the point of this problem is we're going to compare delta y and dy for x equal to 1 and delta x equal to uh, 0.01. Okay, so what this is saying is this. This, this equation, what is its graph? A parabola, right? In fact, it's the standard parabola. It's the standard parabola. Okay, so then let's draw a quick sketch of what this is supposed to be. So then it looks something like, oh, I always do that, don't I? It looks something like this. Okay, so then now, what we're going to do is we're going to move over to x is 1. We're going to move over to x is 1, which I'll say is about right here. Okay, then we're going to make the tangent attachment there. Make the tangent attachment. <coughs> okay, so then I'll sort of oop, sketch what that's going to look like. It's just a sketch. So then what we're saying is that, okay, we, we went to x is 1, we made the tangent attachment there, and now we're going to compute, uh, we want to estimate how much the function changes if you move to the right just a little bit. How much to the right are we going to move? 0 0.01, right? And we're going to see, we're going to compare how much does the tangent line estimate the change will be versus how much is the exact change. So that's what we're estimating. Okay, so delta y delta y 
will be uh, so then if I if I call this function f of x is x squared just to give it a name then delta y will be f of x plus delta x minus f of x that's how much y changes okay so then let's compute what it is exactly in this case delta y will be okay so then what it, what where am i supposed to plug in All right so at f of 1 plus 0 0.01 right f of 1 plus, you know 1 is the place where we attach the tangent 0 0.01 is delta x so then minus f of 1 okay so then delta y is 1.01 .01 squared minus 1 squared okay so then let's see if I can if I can do this uh, so does anyone have a calculator <laughs> no let's see if I can do it because I didn't bring my calculator so it should be uh, 1 point uh, okay someone get out a calculator my brain is freezing so it should be like 1.0001 or something like this <laughs> Okay, that's even better. 1.0201. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay, and then minus 1. Okay, because I, I, I'm actually able to do 1 squared in my head. So then delta y is 0 0.0201. So this is exactly, exactly how much the function changed. We moved over a little bit. Right, we moved to the right a little bit, and as a result, the function did what? It moved up a little bit. We moved over a little bit, the function moved up a little bit. Now let's see, what does the tangent say? What does the tangent estimate? <coughs> so next, we're going to consider dy. Okay, so then in this case, in this case, we have that y is x squared, so then dy dx is 2x so that dy is 2x dx so is there any question on how I got to this equation that I'm circling in red any question how I got there okay so then now we want to estimate dy so dy will be 2 times what are we plugging in for x 1 multiplied by what are we plugging in for dx All right we're plugging in 0 0.01 because remember in that in the previous page how how were delta x and dx related they're the same thing they're the same so then now now if you multiply this out then dy is uh, what 0 0.02 and I'll you know normally I would leave it there but I'll write 0 0 there's two zeros behind it so then what do you think pretty close right pretty close <clears throat> 0 0.0200 versus 0 0.201 or whatever so then they differ in the fourth place by one okay so that's pretty good you should you should you know consent right psychologically emotionally to it being pretty good because I mean look at the picture right look at the picture if my picture is anywhere close to accurate and this is like one right then we moved over one one hundredth of that distance you know like right there aren't the tangent line in the graph pretty close right there yeah pretty close and that's what this is saying right delta y is this much dy is this much <clears throat> okay so then now it may or may not surprise you to find out that this is in fact you know when scientists and physicists and engineers and whatever when they make machines and they do things and they're trying to you know say that well we can get this close this is what they're doing you know so for example not too many months ago 
uh, NASA engineers, uh, all, all manner of engineers landed the Mars rover on Mars, right? The, which, what is its name? Opportunity? No, those are the old ones. Curiosity, right? Four billion dollar machine, okay? Went through space at tens of thousands of kilometers per hour, okay? Hurtling toward a planet, itself going tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. <laughs> and they somehow managed to make it, you know, they were able to mathematically guarantee, we don't know exactly where it's going to land, but we guarantee it's going to land within this ellipse that has major radius one and a half kilometers. That is really remarkable. <laughs> one and a half kilometers? Jeez. How many millions of kilometers was it from Earth to Mars? Right? How fast were each of those two things traveling? The, s the planet was even spinning. <laughs> right? And we know it's going to land in that ellipse? That's fantastic. Okay, so then how did they do that? With this. Yeah, so then they have to have very, very good tolerances, right? Engineering tolerances. So I claim no expertise over engineering and mechanical science and all of that kind of stuff. but. Mathematically, this is exactly what they were doing. A more complicated version of this, admittedly, but not so much more complicated. Okay. So then, now, I, I make no claim that you're now qualified to land $4 billion machines on Mars, but I hope that you see that you have the general idea. Okay, so any question about that example before we do another one? Okay, so here's an example. <coughs> here's an example. Estimate the square root of 16.5 using differentials. And it's here at this juncture where I'm very glad that all of the math 2417 instructors decided that calculators would not be allowed this semester. Because every time I ask a question like this on a, on a quiz or an exam, someone just types it into their calculator and says, I don't need to estimate it, I just type it in. And then they get a zero and then they get upset. <coughs> okay, so then estimate the square root of 16 and a half using differentials. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to say, okay, now, I don't know the square root of 16 and a half. I don't know the square root of some things. For example, what's something you know the square root of? 16. You know the square root of 16. So probably we can all reason that 16, well, that's less than 16 and a half. And the square root of 16 and a half, uh, the square root of 16 is 4. So it's probably reasonable to come to the conclusion that the square root of 16 and a half should be a little bit more than 4. It should be a little bit more than 4. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, let's consider the square root function. The square root function. And we're going to select a point of tangent attachment that we can deal with very easily. So can you think of a value that's close to 16 and a half that would be easy to deal with? 16, right? So we'll make the tangent attachment at 16. And then we'll say, okay, now, from this tangent attachment, we're going to move over to the right by how much? By 0.5, okay? And then we're gonna use, we're gonna use the tangent dy, right, the change to estimate what the new value of the function will be. Okay, so does everybody understand the, the sequence of operations? So, the main idea is this, just summarizing this so it's written down. We will use y is equal to the square root of x. We'll make a tangent attachment. at x is 16, because you know the square root is 16. And we will uh, use delta x, which is dx, is 0 0.5. Okay, so linguistically that's the idea, but I want to impress upon you that this is exactly, exactly the same thing we did last in the last example, except this time, <laughs> right? Even it's, even it's almost not creative. Right, so then the last example we used a parabola. This example we're using a square root, right, which is this half of a parabola and then reflect it over y is x. So it looks like this. Ah, I always do that. So 
So then we're going to say, okay, well, here at 16, here at 16, I'll make the tangent attachment. <coughs> then I'll move over a quantity half of a unit. Okay. So then, let's do it. And now I don't, I'm not going to actually ask you about delta y. I'm just going to ask you about dy. So first, we'll compute dy. So then, y is the square root of x. So then dy dx is 1 over 2 square root x. Right, you could get there with the power rule, but hopefully this is one of the ones you memorized. It's useful in my experience for you to simply memorize the derivative of the square root function. So that now you can solve for dy and say that dy is 1 over 2 square root x dx. <coughs> okay, now we start plugging things in. So dy, dy will be 1 over 2, and where, what are we going to plug in for x? 16, and what are we going to plug in for dx? 0 0.5. Okay, so then now this, right, all of this can be done swiftly even without aid of any calculator whatsoever. So this is 1 over uh, 2 times 4 is 8 multiplied by... 1 over 2 because that's 0 0.5. So then dy is 1 16th. Okay? Everybody with me? Now, I'd like to point something out here, and that is that I think it's unfortunate that dy is 1 16th, and also we're making the tangent attachment at 16. That's just a coincidence, right? These numbers don't keep showing up all the time. It's just, this is just coincidence. Okay, so then now, someone tell me why this makes physical sense. Sorry? It's positive, right? It ma that makes sense, right? It makes sense that, you know, uh, we made the tangent attachment at, at 16, and we want to know what's happening to 16 and a half. The square root function is increasing, so it makes sense. It makes sense that dy should be positive. Okay, what's another thing? How about the size of dy? Why does the size of dy make sense? Because we only moved over a little bit. Right? We moved over a little bit, so we should move up a little bit. Okay, so all of that makes, makes good sense. Now, I have a question for you. Is 1 16th the answer? No, right? What was it that, I, that you were instructed to do? Estimate the new value. The new value. Estimate the square root of 16 and a half. Is the square root of 16 and a half approximately 1 16th? No. <laughs> right? No. We already said at the beginning of the problem we're expecting it to be a little bit more than 4. So then, from here, now you say that you say that, well, what I want exactly is y plus delta y. That's what I want exactly. This is approximately equal to y plus dy. Right? Because that's what that picture two or three pages ago was saying, is that, is that if you have a point of tangent attachment, then the quantities delta y and dy are close. So then now, each one of these... I can estimate now. This is y should be the square root of 16. And on the previous, you know, on the previous column on this page, we said plus 1 16th. So this is approximately 4 plus 1 16th. Now, someone tell me why 4 plus 1 16th makes good sense. Yeah, because we, we said at the beginning, the square root of 16 is 4. So the square root of 16 and a half should be a little bit more than 4. And here we have an answer that is a little bit more than 4, so this makes good sense. So now, someone that actually has a calculator, please tell me what 4 plus 1 16th is. 
sorry, sorry, four point what? Zero six five like that? Six two five. Okay. Good. Now, just to convince you, right, the question is now over. Right? But just to convince you that this that this works pretty good, uh, someone that has a calculator, please tell me the first several digits of the square root of sixteen and a half. So it's probably four point zero six. Two what? Two zero one nine two. So what do you think? Did our little technique work pretty good? Yeah, it worked pretty good, right? We had uh, one, two, three, four digits of accuracy. Four digits of accuracy, which brings up an important question. Your calculator, right? It's not full of magical square root pixie dust, right? It's got to be doing something in there. What is it doing? <laughs> it's doing a variety of things. And this, depending on your calculator, it may be doing this. <laughs> it may be doing this exactly. Except that, you know, it just knows other square roots exactly. So maybe it knows like the square root of 16 point, you know, 4, 8, blah, 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 some square root exactly. And then it just uses, can use delta x to estimate it to all of the digits of accuracy available on your calculator. This is what this is what machines do. Okay, so any questions about this example? Any questions about this example? So then as for this example, it's important for the following conceptual reason. Now, I asked you to estimate the square root of 16 and a half. Okay, to estimate the square root of 16 and a half. Many students that don't understand the conceptual question stop right here. They understand that it's got to have something to do with dy, and so then they usually get dy, and then they don't, they don't understand that that's not what I was asking for. That's how much the function changed between 16 and 16 and a half. But what I want is for you to estimate 16 and a half, so this is the answer that is requested in this problem. Okay. I'm just telling you this because in my experience, many students overlook this. So any questions about this? <coughs> hey, what time is it? 34. We're doing good. OK. So then, now, another version of this formula, of this general idea, I don't really like this, but I'll go ahead and give it to you anyway. And that is that if you have a function y is f of x, y is f of x, <coughs> then uh, an estimate for f of x plus delta x is f of x plus delta x is approximately equal to f of x plus the derivative of f of x delta x. So this formula is in basically every calculus book that exists. And in my experience, students just look at this formula and memorize it. And I sort of don't like that because it doesn't actually give you any geometric understanding of what's happening. So then now, let's try and understand at least one, just really quickly before I get into the real details, of why this, is, this formula seems reasonable. And notice that this is approximately equal. It doesn't say equality. It says approximately equal. So then now, if I take this formula, I can solve for f prime. Right? I can solve for the quantity f prime. OK, so then what happens if you, in this equation if you solve for the quantity f prime? What do you get? f prime is approximately what? Yes, f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. Right, so that's obviously, that's, that's reasonable, right? Because, you know, this quotient on the right, right, that quotient on the right is the slope of a secant line where the, the horizontal change is delta x. And the vertical change, right, this thing right here, this is delta y. 
So all that that's saying is that, you know, the derivative is approximately equal to delta y over delta x. Okay, great. Okay. So then now, <coughs> the reason for this, to connect this back to what we did previously, so the reason is <coughs> that we have two things. First, delta y is by definition, by definition, f of x plus delta x minus f of x. Okay, so then we have this. And then in addition to this, in addition to this, because of our previous arguments, what we said is that delta y delta y is approximately dy for some notion of approximate. For, so for those of you that are math or physics majors or whatever and you want to know more about this, then go on because these things, this approximate can be made very precise. For here, we're just going to leave it just sort of sloppy and I'm going to write a wavy equals. Okay, so then now, <coughs> what I can do here is I can uh, take this and I can solve I can take these two equations, or almost equations, and solve for them. So then now I'll remind you that dy, dy is exactly equal to f prime of x. So let me write that somewhere else. That dy is exactly equal to f prime of x dx. So now I can take these things these equations and combine them as, as follows. I can say, well, first I can take delta y is f of x plus delta x minus f of x. And then say, well, okay, <coughs> then in that case, dy is approximately f of x plus delta x minus f of x. Okay, then I can replace dy with f prime of x dx, and then now the system that is in play here, right, dx is synonymous with what other quantity? Delta x, so f prime of x delta x is approximately f of x plus delta x minus f of x. And so now in this last equation, can you see that I can solve for f of x plus delta x? Yeah, I can solve for f of x plus delta x and obtain the following. f of x plus delta x is approximately uh, f of x plus f prime of x delta x. <coughs> Lovely. Okay, and all, of, all that this computation and lines of com computation mean, they're exactly that picture. They're the picture that says, if the function is smooth and it has a tangent attachment, then you can attach the tangent line and you can follow the tangent instead of the function. And if you don't go very far, the difference in using the tangent and the function is small. Okay, it can be as small as you wish. Okay, so any questions about this? <coughs> any questions about this? Okay, so then now let's do another interesting question. And by interesting, I actually mean not interesting. <laughs> okay, so then how about let's do another one of those estimate problems. So how about estimate estimate something great. So then how about the cube root? We'll estimate no, we'll do it to the four thirds. We'll estimate uh, four thirds cube root uh, 124 to the four-thirds. Yeah, that sounds great. With differentials. Okay, with differentials. Okay. Someone give me an idea.
Sorry? Yes, we need, we're going to need to have dy, right? Somehow, we're going, we're going to need dy. So I'll write that comment down. You know, this is like the thought process. We need dy. Okay, but if we're going to have dy, then we first have to decide what y is in the first place, right? Uh, it could be, but that wouldn't be very nice because do you know, do you know how to compute four thirds? I mean, 124, you can't compute four thirds, the four thirds exponent of that easily. So what you need is you need, a, you need some value that's close to 124, that it's easy for you to compute the cube root of, or, and, and four, four thirds root of, or whatever it's called. Okay, so then, so we need a function. We need y. So what do you think? So let's use x to the 4 thirds, right? So then we were computing a square root on, on the, la the previous example. Now we're doing 4 thirds, so we're going to use x to the 4 thirds. Okay, now can you think of a place that is close to 124 that you can compute 4 thirds of quite easily? 125. Right, 125, and this should this you should see this, right? You should see this because you don't have a calculator, you're not going to have one, so you need to be able to see these things. Why is 125 easy? Because five cubed is 125. So then, what I want you to see is this: 125. Okay, Th this is not part of the computation. This is part of this is part of you know, you, you coming to the correct conclusion. It is, you can say, well, 125 to the 4 thirds, well, according to the rules of exponents, that is, that is 125 to the 1 third to the 4. Right? That's the rules of exponents. Now, can you compute the cube root of 125? You should be able to. Okay, it's 5 to the 4. And can you compute 5 to the 4? You should be able to. It's 625. Right? So then now, what's happening here is I, I want you to compute the 4th, 4 thirds power of 124. Okay, I want you to estimate it. But, but, um, you know, you don't know that one. That one's not, that, you don't have that one. But you do know 125. So the point of tangent attachment is further to the right than the place that you want. So instead of, instead of making a tangent attachment and then moving a little bit to the right, we're going to make a tangent attachment and move a little bit to the left. So does everyone see what we're doing? So we're going to take y is this with the tangent attachment point x is equal to what? 125. And we're going to take delta x synonymous with dx is what? Negative 1. Right? Negative 1. So then now, if we just did this little computation in this box over here on the right, 625. That's if we were at 125. Now we're doing 124. So someone tell me, how will the answer look? It will be a little bit what? A little bit less than 625. Right, that's what it should be. If your answer is not a little bit less than 625, then you have made a conceptual error. Okay. Good. So, in this case, dy dx is what? 4 thirds x to the 1 third, like so. So then you can solve for dy and say that dy is 4 thirds uh, x to the one third dx. Four thirds x to the one third dx. <coughs> okay, so now we can estimate dy by plugging in. dy is four thirds. Okay, now we're plugging in 125 for x to the one third, and we're plugging in negative one for dx. Okay, so then dy is negative 4 thirds times 5, negative 4 thirds times 5, 
So dy is uh, what? Negative 20 thirds. And if you had a calculator, if you had a calculator, that would be what? Six and two thirds. So, so dy is negative 6.6 .6 repeating. <clears throat> OK, great. So then, is the answer to the question negative 6.6 .6 repeating? No, right? It better not be. Right? So the answer is, right, what we want, what we want is y plus delta y. That's exactly what we want. Now we can't, we can't get it exactly, right? But that's not what you were asked. I, was at, I asked you to estimate it. So y plus delta y, that's approximately y plus dy. Okay, so then this is approximately 125 to the 4 thirds plus negative 6.6 .6 repeating, okay, which is approximately 625 minus 6.6 .6 repeating. So then, you know, that's like 618 something something. So does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense. Our answer should be a little bit less, a little bit less than uh, 625. So someone with a calculator, would you please tell me what this is to several decimal places? So 6, uh, 19, 18, I guess I can do it right, 618.3 repeating. So that's our, our estimate, 618.3 repeating. Now, so the question is over, but now, just to assuage your fears that maybe we're doing some kind of forbidden magic, would you please, someone with a calculator, plug this into your calculator and tell me what the calculator says? Three, four, two, two, three, eight. Is that pretty close? Pretty close, right? We got uh, one, two, three, four digits of accuracy. Four digits of accuracy. And in physical sciences, four digits of accuracy, man, that's good. If you have four digits of accuracy, you're in pretty good shape. Right? So the most precise physical measurements going on in physics these days have like 10, 11 digits of accuracy, like in quantum electrodynamics. But in other things, man, you have four digits of accuracy, you're in good shape. Okay, so any question about this? What time is it? Ah, we're just about done. So then, now, do I want to say anything else? Okay, so then, no, I, I just want to look at this picture, and I want to remind you what it is that we're doing. Right, this is the picture. This is everything. Sometimes I ask you to estimate the change in y, and then the answer is dy. Sometimes I ask you to estimate a value, and then you don't need dy, you need y plus dy. That's the answer. So sometimes, sometimes I just want you to tell me this vertical change. Sometimes I want you to tell me what is the total vertical height, which is y, the previous vertical height, plus the change that you estimated. So sometimes it's the one, sometimes it's the other. Okay, so then this comes up a lot you know, in other contexts where, you know, you might have a business or an engineering situation where the problems or your boss or whatever says, okay, I need you to arrange matters so that we are this accurate, right? So then maybe the federal, the U.S. federal government re financial reporting requirements say we have to be within half a percent of accuracy for our books. So I need you to I need you to perform a mathematical analysis and project what's going to happen and be accurate to within half a percent. You can do that using these techniques. Or, you know, more, more excitingly, we've got a four billion dollar <laughs> truck that we want to land on Mars. And we need it to land in this ellipse. Can you do that? And the answer is, you know, maybe. <laughs> if, you're, if everything goes really good, right? And nothing blows up. Okay, see you on Friday. <clears throat>